Hi, uh, I'm Masahiro Sakurai, uh, director of Smash Brothers. Super Smash Brothers. Everybody has played it at least once. It's like the Met Gala of video games. Anybody who's anybody gets an invitation. Both the series and its creator, Masahiro Sakurai, get a lot of love. But the man behind the games has had a pretty complicated relationship with his creation. Just hear him talk about completing the latest game in the series. I wonder if I'll ever get to take a break. But not until the bourgeoisie are liquidated. Okay, okay, okay. I added in that last bit. But this little clip happened during an official Nintendo presentation. It's kind of a joke, but not really. I mean, this is the same guy who wouldn't stop working even when he was attached to an IV drip. Clearly, there's a bigger story here. Now, talking about video games and social issues is never easy. I actually made a video half a year ago on Smash Brothers and representation, and it got really mixed responses. Mostly because it was, not gonna lie, not that good. But I think I can handle this topic, because me and Masahiro Sakurai have some shared understanding. In the video, I talk about the inclusion of skin tone variants for characters who have them in their games. Bam! We get it in Ultimate. I brought up race switching certain characters in their alternate costumes, and what do you know, Black Ken. Clearly, we are the same person. Oh, shit. <laughs> Ooh, okay. So I want to dig deeper than the usual narratives you see online. What is the story behind this man? Is he an oppressed worker or an obsessed auteur? Masahiro Sakurai's career in the game industry began with HAL Laboratories in 1989, where he designed Kirby at only 19 years old. After directing a few Kirby games, Sakurai and his supervisor, the late Satoru Iwata, collaborated to create a prototype of a fighting game featuring Nintendo characters. Impressed by the prototype, the higher-ups in Nintendo approved the project that would become known as Super Smash Bros. Releasing in 1999, the platform fighter was a major success, selling over 5.5 million units. And with the success came the pressure to make a sequel. And the pressure to deliver can be debilitating. With a development time of only 13 months, Sakurai referred to his time working on Melee as grueling. I'd work for over 40 hours in a row, then go back home to sleep for four. I was living a really destructive lifestyle. Iwata returned to help with the brutal development cycle, all in an attempt to meet the demands and pressure of Sakurai's biggest project ever. And it paid off. Released in 2001, Melee was even more wildly successful than its predecessor. After Melee, Sakurai decided to leave HAL Labs. He wanted more freedom that HAL just couldn't provide. He wanted out of corporate and to work with a wider breadth of creators and content. This decision didn't come easy either. Leaving HAL was actually a huge risk. He was paid well, rent was cheap, and he had health insurance. If he wanted to keep pushing out games as a business, he had made it. But in a 2003 interview, Sakurai revealed his apocalyptic premonition. According to him, the gaming industry was bursting at the seams. Developers were increasingly feeling the pressure since newer consoles required increased development costs. One flop could be enough to cause an entire studio to shut down. And whether their game sold 100,000 copies or 100 million? Their pay would be the same, so they weren't incentivized to innovate, only to be consistently average. This created a divide between the creators and the consumers. Sakurai noted how he saw sales departments that knew more about what the fans wanted than the developers of the games themselves. Which, in light of his own questionable design choices, is ironic, but we'll get there. Sakurai saw that the industry was moving towards stagnation and competition, when above all else, it needed to be unified and he wanted no part in it. The same year the interview happened, Yoshiki Okamoto, one of the brains behind Street Fighter 2, made a similar choice and took a leap of faith. He decided to leave Capcom to start his own indie company, Game Republic. The guy behind one of the most successful franchises ever, Jumping Ship? It understandably caused a lot of commotion in the industry. Yet unlike Sakurai, 
Okamoto was unsuccessful and Game Republic closed in 2011. Today, he makes mobile games. So Sakurai became a free agent and really tried to get his message out to the rest of the industry. He worked on a few small titles like he wanted, wrote books and spoke at conferences to urge companies to reconsider their approach to the medium. Meanwhile, Nintendo was on fire and not in the good way. Satoru Iwata had taken over as president of the company and after two commercial failures, the company needed a big break. We would like to play. The release of the Nintendo Wii in 2006 was a major realignment for the company meant to breathe new life into Nintendo. Pulling out all of the stops, Satoru Iwata announced that Super Smash Bros. Brawl was coming to the Wii in E3 2006. Sakurai was caught by surprise at the announcement since he had no idea a sequel was planned for the franchise he created. Following the presentation, they both met in private. Iwata, friend and mentor to Sakurai, presented the following options. Either Sakurai comes on board to create a sequel, or they move forward without him. In an Iwata Asks interview, Iwata jokingly admits to threatening Sakurai with this proposal. And while it's clear that their relationship was a lot chummier and sincere than your average CEO to upper middle management, it was still a power move. This ended his independent run, and he's been working on blockbuster sequel after blockbuster sequel ever since. After the Wii U was a commercial failure, Iwata wanted to ensure the success of the Nintendo Switch, and asked Sakurai to work on a new Smash game that would become Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, the culmination of nearly 20 years of Smash and Nintendo history. The game would include all fighters and nearly all stages from the previous games in a grand celebration. Sadly, Iwata was not here to receive it, as he passed away suddenly in 2015. Sakurai continued development, saying I will continue on doing what I must, as development entered its final stages in 2018, still mourning his old friend, Sakurai asked, can I cry a little now? It's clear that despite his efforts, Sakurai was unsuccessful in trying to enact the great change his idealistic younger self envisioned. He continues to question whether each successive Smash game will be his last, since each game is a huge emotional and physical undertaking. He did somewhat succeed in uniting different companies despite the odds in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, but the industry unity he wished for is still a pipe dream. All in all, things have gotten worse. Smaller studios continue to shut down, and larger ones have grown, infinitely pushing out mediocre titles. This is all without bringing up catastrophic failures like Epic Games, Rockstar, Telltale, Riot Games, the list just goes on. So is this the fate of the gaming industry and our favorite developers? A life void of creative freedom? Spent in crunch time that slowly deteriorates your well-being? It doesn't have to be. In the book Capitalist Realism, the late Mark Fisher puts forward the theory that a capitalist society will eventually face the dystopian reality of the end of culture. When younger generations are unable to produce original pieces of art, we will be left to perpetually and mindlessly relive the same culture of our past, never being able to create anything new forever. It's apocalyptic, but it's a good metaphor to start talking about gaming. Because holy shit, for every Super Mario Galaxy, we have four new Super Mario Brothers. They're the same fucking game. Clearly we're not living in Fisher's dystopian world, as creative new titles continue to get pushed out. And Nintendo, more than other publishers, generally do whatever the hell they want following the beat to their own drum. 
but it's undeniable that restricting new video games and ideas to the worlds of existing franchises hurts the ability of developers to make new experiences. And Sakurai has levied similar criticisms. Is there any industry that relies so much on reusing their old titles as much as video games? Compared to other media like movies, dramas, animation, novels, and comics, the glut of franchises and remakes is at an unnatural level. It's like a quote ripped straight out of the book. This is not the fault of individual development teams or even publishers. Yeah, I'm gonna leave Activision and EA off the hook. You see, the gaming industry is the perfect microcosm for wider economic trends. In economics, a few things tend to happen in highly competitive environments like gaming. While you may start out with a bunch of small competing firms, the cutthroat nature of the competitive environment causes smaller firms to die out or be bought out by their stronger competitors. This repeats, as big companies have more resources to invest in their products and technology. Eventually, all you're left with is a select few titanic companies who can keep all smaller competitors out. This is basically what happened during the 2000s and it's why most games are either AAA titles or small indie ones. We're in the final minutes of a long game of Agario. Under these circumstances, publishers and development management teams need to figure out how to scrape out any competitive edge over their rivals. This is where loot boxes, DLC, and monetization schemes come in. Any method to pile on more cash into the coffers. Another way to do this is looking towards labor. Labor is a malleable, pliable resource, and if they can squeeze more labor out of less workers, they can save some necessary money. That's where you see downsizing, increased work hours, moving away from permanent employees to contractors, cutting pay, and so on. All done to increase the gold in the war chest that gives publishers more leeway and cushioning in the market. It's in these highly competitive environments where endless sequelization makes absolute sense. Because sequels are the best bet in this environment. AAA titles are high risk, high reward investments with hundreds of moving parts. And well, sequels are safe. So try as he might, Sakurai would not be able to put a dent in the system unless he waged a revolutionary war to take it all down. And his other issues with the industry, like developer pay remaining unchanged even if they delivered an excellent product, or how developers are isolated from the wants of the fans. When firms become so big, the balance of power between developers and publishers is hugely in favor of the publishers. They become the gatekeepers, they control how the industry works. And that means that the wealth flows upwards to the shareholders, not downwards to the workers. Workers without power can do little to fight back, and being dispossessed of power, they just become the machines behind games as a business. This is a pretty grim conclusion. But so, why am I talking about Nintendo? They've been getting a lot of good press recently for treating their workers like humans. And this is a hundred percent a good thing. Good job, Nintendo. That's not to say that they're pro worker or anything, they still have extremely long, hard hours. Workers like autonomy, as corporate routinely tramps over studios' decisions, and they have the same hierarchical system that pushes wealth upwards that everyone else has. And if you go back like a decade or two, you can find a bunch of horror stories about the factory-like conditions at Nintendo. There's a load of other companies I could talk about and Lampoon who have shown the tendencies I've outlined above to the absolute extreme and push workers relentlessly. But that would be way too easy. I've chosen to talk about Nintendo because everything I've outlined applies to them. They just squeeze their workers a little less harder. And if they're good now, they haven't been in the past and won't always be in the future. The right guy might make it into the right position every once in a while, but relying on corporate self-regulation like this is inconsistent at best, and at its worst, it just does not work. We need new solutions to the problem. And if this is the best the AAA industry has to offer, we've got a long way to go. Now, I don't doubt for a second that Sakurai, judging by his writing and experiences, 
generally leans towards a reformist managerial solution to the problem, not any radical labor solution. He was buddy-buddy with the CEO after all and hasn't spoken much directly on the question of labor. Either way, his vision of a solution can be partly read from the ending of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Now without getting too much into the Smash lore, yeah there's a Smash lore, the two main villains Galeem and Darkon can be seen as stand-ins for corporate Nintendo and the Nintendo fandom, respectively. The former takes the spirits of the characters, producing soulless replicas, and the latter chains up Galeem and the characters, preventing them from exercising any form of autonomy. Shout out to Game Theory for the hypothesis. As a developer of such a large franchise, it seems Sakurai thinks the bad guy lies in both overzealous corporate practices and excessive fan demands. The good ending of the game has the spirits of the characters being released from the shackles of both, creating a pillar of light. It's a hard ending to make sense of. <laughs> I mean, what does the freeing of the spirits mean in real life? These characters hold a lot of emotional weight for a lot of people. I know it's easy to be cynical at what are clearly corporate products, but they're meaningful figures to the culture. Just look at the reactions to when Banjo and Kazooie were revealed as DLC fighters. They were all sleeping with them this time. Banjo Kazooie! Yes! Yeah! Oh my God! Oh, oh my God! Wait, no! Why? Wait! wait no! Banjo Kazooie! Ah! These characters take on a life of their own in the hearts of each player who experiences their game. They quite literally have a spirit independent of the publishers who own them and the developers who create their games. The rays of light that Galeem, or Nintendo, uses to control the spirits of the characters has a direct analog in real life. Intellectual property. The power to monopolize a creation and create endless replicas? I mean, I think it's a little on the nose, to be honest. So if we want to free the spirits, we need to take a hard look at IP law. Fun! Video games and IP law are in a really weird place. Video games didn't come into the scene until like the 60s or something, I don't know. And instead of making new laws to account for the technology, countries kind of sort of cram them into the old copyright laws. But the issue here is there is no other medium quite like video games. Are they legally considered visual arts or just computer software? When 300 people work on a project, who's the author? And who owns the rights? I've actually been making my way through the case law to try to wrap my head around it for like the past week and I'm ready to pull my hair out. Now historically it would work like this. Publishers are in charge of providing the funding, they assume the risk if the project fails, and they reap the rewards when it succeeds. In return, they compensate devs and keep the rights to the work developers make because they make it as work for hire. Seems fair, right? Well when it comes to funding, kind of. They're in charge of providing funding for studios and shareholders, so a perfectly self-sustainable studio that makes just enough to break even can get shut down because the shareholders need to satisfy a certain percentage rate on their returns. It's a tale as old as capitalism. And new tech like Kickstarter and GoFundMe have fundamentally changed the playing field. With the rise of crowdfunding, the roles of old school funding through publishers isn't really necessary. Well, what about if the project fails? They do assume the risk. But so do the developers. <laughs> All the stories of laid off video game devs and closing studios should make this one pretty obvious. Studios are never shielded from the realities of the market. Well, okay. But do publishers reap all the rewards while developers get jack shit in comparison? Yeah, Sakurai was spot on here. So developers need a stronger role in the developer-publisher relationship. Before we can address developers stagnant wages, poor working conditions, or whatever issue you might have with the industry, 
any change requires one basic building block. Developers must retain the rights to their creation. Or, to put it more understandably, it means seizing the means of production, baby! Let's go! But seriously, by not owning the rights to their work, developers have given publishers free reign to do whatever the hell they want. Studios and workers are replaceable and mistreatable, since the real power lies in owning the money-making property. This one small change is the battering ram needed to acquire lasting workers' rights. Without it, any right is contingent. The specifics are a little too complicated to get into, but it basically means changing how work for hire laws are structured, and ensuring that the legal rights of a work always belong to those who created it. So, okay, we've shifted the weapons triangle and now developers are in charge of the show, and they have the bargaining power to demand the treatment they deserve. Fantastic. But the spirits aren't quite free. Want to hear an interesting story? Not too long ago, PewDiePie, might have heard of him, got into a bit of a funny situation by paying some guys over the internet to write on a sign. Anyway, around that time, Studio Camp Santos decided to DMCA take down PewDiePie's Let's Play of their game, Firewatch. They weren't anti-Let's Play, they actually loved streamers playing their games. But they filed the DMCA on the basis that their association with PewDiePie was an infringement on their moral rights. See, moral rights are an ancient concept that are meant to guarantee creators certain protections. This includes, among other things, the right to the integrity of their work. Meaning, if some guy you don't like is associating himself with your art, and you believe it hurts the work's integrity, you can shut it down. Now, the details vary per country, and PewDiePie deleted the video anyway, so there was no legal battle, but it's a pretty notable development. Did the guy get what he deserves? Can streaming a game be an infringement on moral rights? Both interesting questions, I'm not gonna answer them. Because, you see, moral rights actually protect your work from modification if the modification hurts the reputation of the creator or work itself. So those naked Zero Suit Samus mods from back in the Brawl days could be considered lewd enough to break Nintendo's moral rights. Unfortunately, it's not just Nazi jokes and naked character skins that'll break IP law. All video game mods are legally infringements on the publisher's intellectual property. You can thank Blizzard for that. So publishers are free to take down any modification they see fit which is what we saw back with Super Smash Bros. Brawl in 2008. It was released to critical acclaim and commercial success, but for a lot of the fans of the series, it wasn't very fun to play. The game was a complete 180 from its predecessor, with slow, floaty gameplay and mechanics like random tripping during a battle that made competitive play less fun for both spectators and competitors. God. I didn't hear that scream. You're right. <gasps> What's gonna happen? Oh, oh strip strip, insult, drop, grab. Wow, thank you, Sakurai. I don't know. So a group of superfans decided to come together and create a mod that would retool the game to play more like the previous one. After thousands of hours spent in development, they created something wholly original that was enjoyable to both watch and play. Unfortunately for the superfan developers, the big N doesn't play well with modders. Nintendo prevented the game from being shown in tournaments, cutting off its potential to grow, and after the company proved it would liberally cease and desist other fan projects, the development team shut down in fear that they would get sued. And this was a non-profit project as far as I know, they never sold this mod. You see, the issue with modding is that modding is labor. The Project M development team poured not just their heart and soul into the mod, but their labor. I feel like a lot of people don't realize this, because it's seen as a weekend hobby project. But you know who does realize it? Publishers. In Marks in the Arcade by Jamie Woodcock, the author recounts how Valve and Bethesda worked together to release paid mods on Steam in early 2015. I hadn't actually heard of this, but apparently the mod community lost their shit. They literally tried to commodify modding and because of the outrage, they made Valve and Bethesda walk it back. 
You know what we call that? Class struggle! Whether the fans realized it or not, they were engaged in class struggle as these massive corporations tried to take over and monetize their work. Who knew Skyrim would be the center of the labor struggle in 2015? So gamers, the consumers, modders, they need rights too. If we want to free the spirits, this means guaranteeing everyone a piece of the IP pie. Obviously developers like Sakurai feel constrained by the obsessive fan demands. It's impossible to satisfy everybody. The only solution I see here is to partially cede control, and allow every fan to make their favorite characters what they wish. This is a big ask to someone like Sakurai who has repeatedly refused to cede control in any of the Smash titles and enjoys being directly hands-on with all of the game's different systems. But I really think the release of Super Mario Maker 2 demonstrates why this is so essential. We're talking Super Mario, right? The Apex video game series, one of the best the industry has to offer. But playing some of the developer levels that come packaged with the game, after playing some of the absolutely phenomenal fan-made ones, you're left with a hollow feeling. Some of them are good, don't get me wrong, but you lose a little bit of your innocence when you realize that the people who make Mario games are just regular ass people. They don't work in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, it's just their 9 to 5. Or, or 9 to 10 p.m., <laughs> however long they work. And other regular ass people are sometimes better at making Mario levels than the actual creators. It blurs the line of legitimacy between creator and consumer. And while the developers behind Nintendo games are fucking amazing at what they do, a lot of hobbyists have the passion, will, and dedication to do the same, if not more. So straight up, modding should not be illegal. Giving players the ability to craft their experience to their liking is really the only way to satisfy fan demands. This way, we can bring actual balance to the publisher-developer-player relationship that has been missing for as long as video games have been around. We can actually free the spirits. Alright, it's time to get all dialectical and shit, so if you're a beginner, brace yourself, because the picture I've painted so far about the video game industry has been overly rosy and really sentimental. It actually obfuscates the truth a little bit. So a good place to start digging deeper would be to return to the book Marks in the Arcade. Woodcock writes that to really understand video games, we need to understand the material reality in which they're made in. Seems simple, right? This includes not only the publisher-developer relationships I've outlined, but the mining of minerals that go into the creation of the machines, the technological limitations of each respective system, the advertising, the voice and artwork, the stores they're sold in, every moving piece that comes together to bring us the modern video game. Just like the rules of natural language bound poetry, and the rules of optics bound photography, these limits drastically reduce the scope of what kind of AAA games can get produced. They serve a narrow role, being tied into a specific production and circulation logic. So what can this tell us about Smash? Woodcock concludes that AAA games are meant to be an incremental and seemingly infinite stream of renewable gaming experiences. And what would an incremental and renewable product require? Well, for one, it means AAA games tend to be serialized, and parts of installments and greater franchises. And what happens to developers under this framework can be outlined further. Video game developers are mainly young men who are passionate about gaming. I mean, come on, it was like everybody's childhood dream job. Publishers exploit the passion that fuels geek culture and video game developers to wring all the passion into capital. There are so many people in the labor pool who want to be game devs that they're treated expendably. So the life cycle of your typical video game dev goes like this. They enter the field young and dedicated, they're then overworked, and because of the natural disillusionment that follows, they tend to leave a few short years after joining, ready to be replaced by the next starry-eyed sap. Depressing. So remember that question I asked all the way at the beginning of the video? Is Sakurai some oppressed worker or an obsessed auteur? He's both. The embodiment of the role developers play in the system. 
someone whose passion and love for their craft is pushed to extreme boundaries, even at the expense of their own health, to meet the demands of video games as a business, and someone who is ultimately expendable. The categories of workaholic and exploited worker aren't mutually exclusive. Instead, they usually feed off of each other, and that's the unfortunate position all of our favorite developers work in. Keeping all of this in our heads, the changes to the Free the Spirits I outlined above seem incomplete. Or at least I haven't given you the entire picture. The only reason AAA games exist is because this games as a business system exists. AAA games and the video game industry survive off of their codependent relationship with each other. That enables a whole lot of fuckery in the process. Neither can continue without the other. The developer-led industry I envisioned with balance restored to devs, pubs, and fans, can't exist in any form we would recognize today as an industry. Because whether us leftist types like to admit it or not, publishers do a lot to games as a whole. They provide the entire structure, funding, and incentives in which we enjoy video games. I truly believe things will be better if we change the circumstances under which video games get made, but we have to understand that this means the games themselves will change too. So goodbye AAA games. If in the future devs retain the rights to their products, it'll be a lot harder to acquire the funding for the high risk high reward products of today. Th this doesn't mean games with polish and care won't be released, but things will probably look a whole lot more like indie markets of today. Lots of in progress games. Small games made by smaller teams with Patreon accounts. This is all conjecture at this point. I need to include a big, but I don't know though, disclaimer because I am not a psychic. But I can see it looking like any other art industry. Lots and lots of small creators at the bottom, and the few developers who create truly memorable and influential games would be able to snag big bucks from publishers to push out the higher quality stuff. Possibly the most exciting change would be what would happen to consoles. I've mentioned hardware only briefly, but in a recent interview Sakurai revealed he doesn't really care about console wars or anything like that. The only thing he cares about is good games. Consoles are really just PCs, and like AAA games, without a publisher-led industry, console wars would probably disappear too. I mean, consoles are only as good as their exclusive games, right? Would developers sacrifice a bigger market and audience for console exclusivity? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Some developers have been taking bribes basically from Epic Games to only sell on their store and not on Steam. Well, but would publishers even invest money into costly R&D for a console that might not even pay off? <laughs> also maybe. We get all kinds of dumb consoles even today. But either way, I think this is the closest way we'd get to that industry unity Sakurai talked about in his younger days, since the market incentives for publishers to make consoles would be a lot less strong than they are today. But I don't know though, I don't know, disclaimer, disclaimer. <sighs> so that's about as good as it could get in a capitalist market for video games. I repeat capitalist because the reforms I've outlined are pretty radical, but they're still reforms. A workers-led industry does not make it socialism or communism, it's still capitalism. A nicer one, but still, the same tendencies are still pulling in the same direction they are today. This makes theory crafting about this ideal hypothetical really hard since capital is elastic, and if it sniffs out profit anywhere, it will find a way. Business always adapts. So who knows how things would work out? A post-capitalist society, on the other hand, would ensure things would get better, but hey, that sounds like a topic for a different video. So how would Super Smash Bros. look in this hypothetical worker and gamey friendly future? Probably a whole lot more like Project M or Mugen even, you remember that game? <laughs> Infinitesimally modifiable games that are made with the collaboration of huge amounts of people. And so, I hope this is the minimum we can do to give back to the people that have delivered us so many memorable experiences. A lot of us owe our childhoods to the individuals behind these games, and I truly think they deserve a lot better. Wanna help me make more content? 
please consider donating. This Titanic video was in the works for about a month and I cannot do this without your help. This video was brought to you by Albi, Anarcho Curious, Ben Harvey, Maxstar, Ashling Evans, Joe, Ludwig Van Bite Me, Tim Wells, Lucas, and all the other contributors who have remained anonymous for their help. Shout out to Blue Truly and the Discorders at the Leftist Incubator Discord, Elgatu and Lesser Magician. Make the algorithm work, y'all. Thank you.